Welcome to the webinar. My name is Laura Cox and I am a lifestyle specialist at Shield Healthcare. I'll be your moderator today. Thank you for attending Shield Healthcare's first spinal cord injury presentation. If you miss any of the presentation or want to watch it again, the webinar is being recorded and will be on our website tomorrow. Viewers will be in listen-only mode, so if you have a question, please type it in the question box to the right, and we will take questions at the end. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Aaron Baker. Aaron. Good morning. I'm happy to be here as the new Shield Healthcare Spinal Cord Injury Lifestyle Specialist. I'm excited to share with you guys today a little bit about myself, my lifestyle, living with a spinal cord injury. So we'll begin uh, on this day, uh, 17 years ago, May 26, 1999. At that time in my life, I was a young, ambitious athlete, traveling the country, racing a motorcycle, um, chasing my dream. It was something that I was really passionate about. I've been riding a motorcycle since I was three years old. Uh, Santa Claus brought me a little mini bike, and that's all I could think about and what I love most to do. So uh, this was, this was uh, my whole life, my whole world. Um, it taught me a lot. It taught me about discipline and sacrifice and work ethic and overcoming fear and working with a team of people to fine-tune my skill set. So I, a lot of who and what I do and how I do it today is rooted in my background as an athlete and as a motorcycle racer. So I, I love what I learned on those two wheels. But on May 26, 1999, uh, it was my rookie season as a professional after a pretty decorated amateur career. I was taking the big leap into the pro ranks and um, I felt good and confident, but on that particular day, I had an accident. Uh, it's pretty common in that sport. I've had broken bones in the past. Um, nothing that really scared me or deterred me from continuing on, but this one uh, was completely different. Clearly, I landed on my head and uh, essentially crushed three vertebrae in my neck. I remember that moment very well. Um, I recall the sound that my neck made when it broke. Um, I never lost consciousness. Um, it, was, it was a really frightening and hard to articulate experience. But I remember laying on the ground and my hand was in front of my face. And I, I can remember trying desperately to wiggle a finger, to twitch a muscle, to do something. And there was barely a breath in my body that, um, uh, I was just clinging to. But somehow instinctively when people rushed to my aid, I was able to communicate and say, you know, please don't touch me. Somehow I understood that had they moved me or tried to take my helmet off or adjust me in any way, that that could make my condition worse. I don't know how I knew that, but that's what I was able to instruct onlookers and bystanders to just say, just call a paramedic, not an ambulance. I need a helicopter. I need help now. And I had somebody lay there with me and just kind of keep me calm. Uh, that was pretty crucial in that time to just keep me from going into complete shock because laying there motionless, um, sensationless, was, was quite traumatic. Fortunately, when the paramedics arrived, again, I was able to instruct these guys. These are the professionals. They deal with trauma every day. And I was able to say, please don't take my helmet off. Just stabilize my neck. I know my neck is broken. Just get me to the hospital as soon as possible, and and uh, they did. Essentially, loaded me in the in the helicopter, and I remember just these muffled sounds and the the whirling, uh, I don't know, the shaking and the the whole transfer 
to the hospital, it was just really scary and frightening because I was barely breathing and it was just a moment in my life that still is in me today and I reflect back on and I'm just so thankful that the team of people came together when they did and got me to the hospital like they did. So I just want to thank those people. It's been a long time, but they truly saved my life. So when I arrived in the hospital, again, I wore my helmet on the gurney into the emergency room. And I recall them doing their pre-op uh, evaluation and they were poking my body with needles, trying to identify if I had any sensation anywhere. And my entire body was numb. I mean, from the chin down, I couldn't feel them poking me with a very sharp needle, uh, except one tiny little spot on the bottom of my left heel, I responded. There was some kind of, uh, you know, awareness that they were doing something in my heel. And right when I said that, they immediately rushed me into surgery. They did remove my helmet. I remember that. <laughs> I was, I was pretty upset about that, but but they did, and fortunately, uh, a brilliant team of, of doctors and a neurosurgeon by the name of John Lee performed uh, emergency surgery, and to my neck with an anterior plate, titanium plate, and five screws, um, fusing C4, C5, and C6 vertebrae. Uh, they rebuilt C5 because it was completely shattered, uh, they used bone from a cadaver. They um, reconstructed my entire cervical spine. And I awoke uh, two days later to a prognosis that I was essentially a complete quadriplegic, paralyzed from the chin down, with a very slim, actually, in the doctor's words, it was a one in a million chance of ever being able to feed myself let alone walk or do anything else. I was intubated on a ventilator machine, hooked up to every you know, life support system they have. I was in a rotation bed that would rotate my body side to side to keep the fluids in my, in my lungs moving, keep the fluids in my body. Um, in that time, though, being immobilized and completely paralyzed, my body uh, was beginning to develop pressure sores. My scapula, my elbows, my coccyx, my heel, the back of my head even uh, became hypersensitive. Uh, although I couldn't really feel anything, um, this is kind of a common secondary complication to this type of injury. Um, but I had to stay immobilized. I had to stay in this rotation bed. So it's like what do you do? I mean, the lesser of two evils. Uh, address the pressure sore at that time or, uh, you know, suffer pneumonia, which inevitably I did. Um, and that brings me to the single most profound moment in my life. Uh, six days later, my lungs filled with fluid. Uh, again, this is common. This is pneumonia with a high-level spinal cord injury. My body is not able to clear the fluid. And I remember looking at my dad on this day just before the respiratory therapist was going to suction my lungs with this torture device vacuum that they would stick down the, the ventilator tube into my chest cavity and they would suction the fluid. It was torture. Out of all this, that is still the most horrific experience is being suctioned by this device. And just before the therapist uh, was going to administer the treatment, she left the room. She was called elsewhere for an emergency. And she handed the device to my dad that was standing at the bedside. And I'm blinking at him, trying to tell him that I can't breathe. I'm suffocating in my own body. And out of my peripheral vision, I could see, I could see the heart rate monitor. I could see my oxygen level, the numbers dropping. Sorry, I'm getting into the story and I'm not sharing the slides. <laughs> it's uh, it's just so real for me. Um, again, here's the, the fusion, small plate anterior. This is, um, I forgot the name of this collar. 
but it essentially goes all the way down my mid torso. I was very lucky in that the neurosurgeon didn't want to put me in a halo, which is pretty common with my level of injury. But this is essentially what happened. I saw my oxygen level numbers dropping 88, 87, 86, and I remember this moment of everything that I thought I knew and understood about my reality kind of began to merge for me. And the struggle in my body to breathe and to remain alive released. And I had this really profound, beautiful moment of release. Kind of a metaphor would be a simple one would be a raindrop falling through the sky symbolizing my lifetime, lands in the ocean, and immediately becomes formless, a part of the whole. That was my beautiful, blissful experience. And I remained in that moment for about a minute until I was resuscitated and brought back to my awareness, to a breath, and gratitude. You know, I, I now have another, another moment, another minute to share my time and my love with my family, my grandmother standing at my bedside, my mother looking into her eyes. And at, in that moment, the paralysis didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. I'm conscious. I'm aware. I'm here. And that's where I started basically reborn the clean canvas to create my life. And so I started my whole process of rebuilding and redefinition and healing by turning inward and visualizing myself from the inside out, my body. And this slide here needs some explanation, <laughs> clearly. This was um, my sister actually painting my toes in the hospital. She thought she would brighten my spirits and have a little fun one day while I was in ICU. She brought out her nail polish and began to paint my toes different colors. Blue on my left big toe, red, green, yellow, all the colors of the rainbow. And I was not happy. <laughs> I couldn't kick her or fight her away, so she did it anyways. And, and what this actually did for me was when I would turn inward and, and envision my body and think about connecting my mind to the muscles and recognizing that I'm just moving energy willfully, I started to draw colors of light through, from my mind down through my body into my toe. And that's where it began. I began to flicker my left big toe. And this was within the first, the first month of inpatient um, acute rehabilitation. Once I was transferred out of uh, ICU, stabilized, uh, this whole process began within the first month, then four months. And at that time, 17 years ago, we were able to convinced our insurance to keep me in the hospital for nearly six months. Today that is unheard of. Our system is not like that at all. And if we could, I would always say, yes, stay in the hospital as long as possible because that's the place where you're going to get the best care. You've got the best opportunities with healthcare professionals to help you learn about your condition, stabilize your body before you transition home. So again, I was in an inpatient for nearly six months. And then I was an outpatient for another six months. So to have that kind of rehabilitation within the first year, um, unfortunately, is not available today. But going back to this moment of flickering a toe to contracting a muscle to firing a growth motor movement, uh, we just 
celebrated each and every step, each and every flicker meant so much. It means so much. It's so important. I tell this to, to new patients or clients today or anybody that I meet to really slow down and recognize, you know, how important just a flicker, a connection is. You know, so it's, it's worth recognition and celebrating. I still do that to, to this day. And if you just build those, build upon those, I think I I use the, the example of Legos. You know, you build a structure one tiny brick at a time. And that's essentially what I've done and I continue to do. One year post-injury, when I was discharged, insurance said, that's it. Uh, you're not going to have any more uh, covered rehabilitation. Uh, it was really my darkest time. I knew there was something inside me I wanted to to do the best I can. I wanted to work. I had this opportunity, my parents, my family, my mother specifically, facilitated an optimal healing environment for me to just focus on my body and my healing. But there was nowhere to go. We were discharged and I was, you know, trying to transition into a gym, a regular facility. The equipment's not adaptive. The clinicians don't understand my condition. And I was depressed severely to the point of wheeling my electric wheelchair to the edge of a swimming pool and staring into that water knowing that all I had to do was push the joystick forward and that would be it. And what was scary was that I was fearless because I had already drowned once in my body and I knew I could do it again. But that's the reality and the gravity of this injury and how traumatic and the ripple effect it has uh, when something like this occurs. And I say that that's okay to experience that. I mean, that's real. That's human. It's, it needs to be felt and understood. You can't deny that or dismiss it. When I talk about this stuff, and I'm not just this super uber positive, happy-go-lucky guy. I am real, you know. This stuff hurts, but this stuff is amazing as well. You know, so I channeled that anger. I channeled that that frustration. I channeled all of this into my body and into progressing whatever I had, whatever little flicker of return of function I had. I just continued to build that, continued to push forward. And this was one year post injury. This slide. This is. This is my new business partner now. This is my brother from another mother, Taylor Kevin Isaacs. He was former professor professor of kinesiology at Cal State Northridge uh, here in LA. And he was a kindred spirit, uh, a brilliant clinician, a former professional soccer player. We had an unspoken understanding about athletics and, and a progressive mindset. He was on the leading edge of uh, spinal cord injury rehabilitation. He was doing uh, case studies on the topic, and when we met, I brought the motivation, he had the education, and together we set and achieved so many milestones uh, on this whole long road of recovery. So this is just a couple of photos of us working in an adaptive gym within the university setting. This was not available to the public at that time. I got really lucky. This was the light that brought me out of that dark, desperate place that I was in. And we were steadfast, so dedicated and committed to a process of healing and working well outside the box. We didn't leave any stone unturned. I was working out four to six hours a day, five to six days a week. He, was, he took me on as a case study. We just really engaged a process that um, I'm forever grateful for. The amount of information that I learned from this man and continue to learn uh, is invaluable. And that's something I really want to impress across to healthcare professionals is the education, the information that you can disseminate to your patient or to your client. That was the most valuable thing for me 
I became a student of my body. I have come to understand the mechanisms, the biomechanics of my of my of this vessel, this machine that is just so incredibly resilient at times, uh, malleable. It heals. It wants to, and that's what we've done. That's what we're doing. That's what I continue to do to this day. I'm 17 years post injury, and I can tell you that if I stop doing what I do, then my body regresses very quickly. I suffer a whole long list of secondary complications that are painful and difficult to manage. Skin breaks down, bones demineralize, muscles atrophy, joints contract, bowels and bladder impacted and affected, early satiety, blood pressure issues. Um, the list goes on and on. And I can tell you that by engaging this process of full spectrum mindful movement, health and wellness, I reduce or stave off, I should say, these secondary complications. I'm able to manage this body. I'm able to manage this condition and have more control over it rather than it controlling me. So I took all this hard work from the gym more than five years work. We didn't deviate from this path for the better half of five years. And I wanted, there was something missing. I, I was having all these incredible returns of function, um, able to stand, able to make steps, uh, you know, all this incredible strength and, and achievement in the gym, but something was missing. I needed more. I wanted to continue progressing. And I have this adventurous spirit. I wanted to be outside. I wanted to be able to, you know, experience the wind in my face and and my heart rate in the sun. And I was able to do that from the form of a bicycle, a funny looking bicycle, <laughs> a tandem bicycle. I had never seen one of these types of bicycles before in my life. But one day while in, in the, uh, the facility at the university, there was a tandem bicycle hanging on the wall in the back room. And I was staring at that thing going, man, that thing is really odd looking. But it makes sense. I can't steer the bike. I can't brake it or control it really. But I could sit on the back seat. I was pretty confident of that. And so we did. We took the bike off the wall. And I had my mother and, and Taylor. They helped transfer me up onto the seat. They sat me there on that tiny bicycle seat, definitely uncomfortable. Um, we strapped my hands to the handlebars. We strapped my feet to the pedal. And I sat there for five minutes. And that's all I could do because my blood pressure was dropped dramatically. My arms weren't strong enough to hold me. My torso collapsed. But it was a glimpse. It was just a glimmer of hope that, yeah, we can make this thing work. We're going to now make that a goal. I want to be able to ride that bicycle. So we adjusted my training. We adjusted everything. We made modifications to the bike. And from that five minutes to one mile, we completed a mile. Again, a flicker, a Lego, you know, a tiny step forward to five miles. So all of a sudden, we're riding this tandem bicycle. And the wind is in my face, and my body's beginning to sweat, and my heart is pumping, and I'm actually out in it. And it, it's just such an incredible feeling, and a sensation um, of accomplishment, and again, gratitude, being able to do it. So uh, true to my nature of uh, relentless progression, I thought, okay, we're riding this bicycle, and it takes a lot of work. I would like to do more with that. I'd like to share this ride. So we set our sights on an LA Marathon. And this is my mother in this photo. She is the one that stepped up uh, fiercely to ride with me. And she wasn't a cyclist before this, but she definitely became uh, a strong leader on this bike. And we worked really hard to compete in and complete our first LA Marathon in uh, 
early 2000, 2004. And we did 26.2 miles. It was amazing. It was uh, stressful because there's a whole lot of bikes in that race. <laughs> but it was a huge achievement for us on this on this journey. And from one LA marathon to another, to another, we did three of those, and we were actually giving a presentation together. We were on stage speaking to a great group of uh, of doctors, and I blurted out like Forrest Gump. I said, "Hey, if we're going to ride this bicycle, why don't we just do it like Forrest and ride it across the country?" And my mom looked at me like I'm crazy, and totally surprised, but I stated it. It was my declaration. I said, this is our next big goal. And we trained for three years and put together our first U.S. bicycle tour. We called it the Rise Above Tour, where we effectively rode that tandem bicycle with a group of my best friends from San Diego, California, 3,182 miles oops, sorry, uh, across the country. St. Augustine, Florida, and this is us, out in the middle of nowhere, Texas. We followed these maps. It was an incredible journey. It took us uh, about three and a half months. Um, the management of my condition was vital to make this happen. At this point in my process, I've become a master of listening to what my body needs because I suffer still with blood pressure issues, thermoregulation, bowel and bladder, uh, all these issues. So being out there on the road, completely exposed, putting myself through uh, these real significant physical challenges and mental challenges, uh, it heightened my awareness and it made me super diligent uh, you know, with maintaining my overall vitality and health. I was calculating my risk and managing my energy. And we did so. We did so as a team. And that's something that you know I'm going to emphasize over and over, and that's the, the people that you keep around you with this condition. Uh, it doesn't really matter how badly you want to, to do something on your own. It does take a small village. It does take people uh, that are empathetic and compassionate and patient and willing to assist. That is how we've made these things happen. Yes, I have the will to do it, but together we make these things happen. We've coined a, an acronym, TEAM, T-E-A-M. Uh, I say, together each achieves more. And this slide shows that. My dad's behind the wheel, giving us a thumbs up. One of my dear friends, Adam, is on the front of our tandem bicycle flanked by my other two friends, Adam and Ben. And we're just carrying on, one pedal stroke at a time. When we re reached the end of that tour, I was really tired of sitting back seat. <laughs> I had gained enough strength in my body, which enabled me to pedal under my own power. This uh, was a huge, um, huge achievement huge accomplishment for me. I, I dreamt of these moments. I actually had this image in my mind in ICU. Uh, funny, I was never keen on chamois or wearing tight lycra gear like this, but I had these crazy morphine-induced dreams that I would be wearing this type of stuff, riding a bicycle through farm fields. And here is that image. I was able to create this tricycle bike where there's two wheels on the back of a standard bicycle, allows me to just stay balanced and stable, clip my feet into the pedal, which keeps me nice and secure, my body strong enough to stabilize my torso, my arms, and this is me in 2008, pedaling through the farm fields, the orchards uh, of Southern California, and to my nature, I wanted to do it again, so we did. The Rise Above Tour 2008, we left from San Francisco, California, pedaled 4,202 miles to Washington, D.C. That was 
four months, my mother and me, set off on another grand adventure. And this time, instead of being backseat uh, following her, uh, we rode side by side. It was incredibly special for us. And what she has done for me over all these years, to share that ride with her uh, is something I will always cherish. So here we are leaving San Francisco, up and over the Sierra Nevadas, through Lake Tahoe, down the backside into Nevada, and we just did, again, one step at a time, one flicker of movement, one pedal stroke, everything moves us forward, and that is essentially what we're doing, what I do. Here we are uh, at Mount Rushmore, incredible, uh, the time of year, uh, we left June 10th, and so this was Right about this time, I think, uh, end of July, 2008. And here we are. We made it. Now, in this photo, you can't really tell, but my mom is in a right here. What happened was in Ohio, uh, some dogs ran out across the road. I was able to swerve and avoid them, but my mom hit the dogs and fell, and she broke her elbow. She had to have surgery. Her elbow pinned. And we were down for about a week. But what she did was she couldn't ride a regular bike. She started riding a recumbent bike, which is behind us in this photo. You can't really tell. But it was interesting. I started to support her for the rest of the tour rather than she supporting me. And that was a really special opportunity for me to now reverse the role and we were able to kind of nurse ourselves together to steps of the White House. And right here in Washington, D.C., this is the end of the, the 2008 Rise Above Tour. And just when we wrap that up, the Olympic Committee came calling. Of course, I wanted to keep going forward. I wanted to keep progressing my body. I wanted to see how far I could take this. What could I actually achieve? And this was actually a dream. Of mine. I wanted to experience the Olympic level. I wanted to find the absolute peak performance in myself, in my, my mind, my body, and I was invited to begin training as a Paralympic hopeful. This was at the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista, California. I was, got the opportunity to sit side by side with some of the world's greatest athletes and coaches learned so much in this period of time from 2009 to 2012. I attended multiple national championships in 2011. I won a national championship in the time trial. On paper, we were slated to medal in the 2012 Olympic Games in London. I was a shoe-in for my division and extremely excited to go and represent our country as a Paralympic athlete, recovering spinal cord injured, uh, quadriplegic, riding a tricycle. So I was, I was hell bent on getting to that to that that point in this uh, cycling career. But I'll tell you, life doesn't always pan out the way we hope. When I tell this story, um, I think back and. I feel good about what had happened to me. Two days prior to getting on an airplane and going to Rome, Italy for the, the World Cup, which is the selection event for the, the, the Olympics, my body had had enough. It said, we're not going to do this. My bladder distended. It nearly ruptured. I was rushed to the hospital. I had an adverse effect to the medication. And this was the photo that I had to send my coaches that were already in Italy and say, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to make it. And this was the end of my Paralympic cycling career. And that's okay, because again, the cliche saying it's not about the destination, it's the journey. This holds true. This is what it was about. And I think it's a bit more relatable when I talk to, when I talk to people about this. 
we all set goals for ourselves. We all have expectations, and you know, when life happens and we don't, they're not met, or they they change the course. You know, that's just what happens, and this is relatable for us. Whereas, had I gone to London and had I meddled, I'd be sitting here showing you a medal right now, and what does that really mean? What does that do for you? Uh, it's not relatable. So I'm grateful for this experience and how it really panned out. I saw it all the way through. I saw it right up to the end where my body said, that's it, and I'm happy that, um, that I got that experience. I have beautiful friendships and relationships because of all that. And I know myself well because of that entire process. What I learned on that bicycle, what my body allowed me to do was incredible and Coming from where we started, wow. So what do you do, you know, when life changes so quickly? Well, you just reinvent and you move on. So I wanted to reverse some of the ill effects of that much cycling. And actually, uh, I, I, I did myself a bit of a disservice physically by putting that much time on a bicycle. I spent the majority of my energy pedaling and not working on function. So I wanted to walk again. And by doing that, I put myself in a situation where I needed to walk myself uh, into better shape. And so my adventurous spirit took me to the desert, Death Valley. 2013, I walked 20 miles across one of the most inhospitable places on our planet, uh, Death Valley. It was probably the most challenging um, adventure to date. It forced me to be my best, to apply every bit of information, every tool, every ounce of energy and focus into managing myself through this trek. I devised a buggy device. Thought about that one day while I was pushing a grocery cart through the, the, the store. I thought, okay, this will allow me to be stable and walk upright. It will allow me to have perfect steps and posture. Uh, it'll, it's safe for me. Uh, it was 100 pounds. It was loaded down with all my equipment. Uh, even a portable bathroom stool because that is still a secondary complication to my injury where I'm suppository dependent. Um, it is a bowel program. It takes time. Uh, I need to have the right um, uh, equipment to make that happen. And so fortunately, I was able to research and find the right stuff. And it is on that buggy right there. And I was able to have a multiple successful bowel movement in the desert by myself. Um, and that was really liberating for me because my life kind of revolves around a bowel and bladder. Um, and so this was, I think, day three on my trek. This is my setup here. I had a cot that I was able to lay down supine and and manage my blood pressure when I needed to. There was no shade, so I brought my umbrella. I brought uh, my uh, solar panels for my power. All my needs were right here, very self-sufficient. I did have a friend with me, uh, a cameraman. We documented this, and he was my kind of my insurance policy, my plan B. If anything happened uh, where I needed to uh, you know, be rescued, he could do it. He was uh, he's a, a strong guy that I have full faith in, and he understands my condition, so this is what gave me the confidence to embark on something like this. But I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, Death Valley, a recovering quadriplegic, managing my complications. Um, it's totally possible. It's totally doable. When I see other people with a similar condition, whether confined to the chair or have um, return of function, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the, 
the spirit and the will within you to explore and uh, make the most of this condition. And I think that's what I'm showing through my actions. I'm really passionate about sharing that with people because we're the possibilities, the possibilities are really endless. Like I, I'm so adamant about making sure that just because you have a spinal cord injury doesn't mean that you, you know, your life stops or that you have to be confined or limited in any way. That's uh, against like who I am. So I'm just really excited to just keep sharing this process. Again, this is another toy that I've created to get out there and have fun. I call this thing the honey badger. Um, when I just want to go out and relax and not worry about blood pressure and just pedal my legs, move my body, uh, I've got this bicycle. Uh, it's a new prototype creation that uh, is a lot of fun. And I guess this, this photo captures it. You know, I, I don't really follow the trail. I kind of blaze a new one or make my own. This was last year racing down Mammoth Mountain. It's called the Kamikaze. Calculated risk. You might say that that uh, I'm taking these risks, but this is well within my comfort zone. This bike is completely stable, very comfortable. I'm completely secure and confident on this thing. And if I put anybody else in this bike, uh, they too um, feel how kind of safe it really is. I'm just going to move right on to uh, something that I feel is most important in my life and really help um, drive all that I do, and that's, that's love. Love for my own life, love for those around me, um, and sharing that in any and every way possible. I met the love of my life, the most incredible relationship that I've ever had. Um, I'm cultivating that on a daily basis. This is a beautiful picture of, at this time, my um, fiance, Katie Devine. And this time last year, we married. And I was able to make the most important walk of my life down the aisle. It's, uh, it's been quite incredible, this journey, to have come so far, uh, to have experienced so much, to learn so much, and to, to be able to now uh, be at this point where I have a partner in life that supports me. Um, she doesn't know me before my injury. She accepts me for who I am and what I live with and how I deal and manage with a spinal cord injury. She is learning every day. I do my best to educate her about the condition. I have so many great friends with spinal cord injuries, and she's there to learn and help and assist wholeheartedly. So I feel very um, honored and grateful to have a partner that is willing to just be there and support no matter what. And for me, to be able to do that for another person, uh, I feel really good. Uh, and purposeful. And on that topic of purpose, we have my mother and I um, on this journey recognized that there was a huge gap between traditional insurance subsidized PT, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and regular fitness. As I was saying earlier, uh, you know, once you're discharged, where do you go? That's why I became so depressed was because I, I wanted to to improve the quality of my life, but there was nowhere to go. So, you know, if not me, who? If not now, when? Um, my mother and I decided, let's just create a space. I know that I need it for the rest of my life. I know what it does for me. And by giving people an opportunity to literally come through the doors of a facility that has the unique and specialized equipment and clinicians, that understand complex conditions, neurological conditions, spinal cord injury, stroke, MS, obesity, cancer, survivors, veterans. You know, we're very inclusive. We open core, the Center of Restorative Exercise. That's what we do. Um, it's, this is my purpose. My purpose is to share. 
and to give people hope and opportunity if they choose. This is what I do on a daily basis as a spinal cord injury lifestyle specialist. I live this with every ounce of my being. Um, I'm grateful to, to have this space and to give smiles and hope and opportunity. So, you know, together we truly rise. This is, uh, this is a journey that is challenging, without a doubt, no joke, but something that I'm very passionate. And I, I say all the time that I wouldn't change a thing. You know, the, the struggle and the, the difficulty is life-affirming. You know, it keeps me absolutely grounded and aware and grateful. And I thank my spinal cord injury for that every day. These are just some statistics, you know. The spinal cord injuries happen to anybody at any time. Um, huge number of, of people uh, experience spinal cord injury and the effects that it has on them personally and, like I said earlier, the ripple effect within their family and their friends and their communities. Um, 54 cases per million. You know, these are big numbers. Um, just general stats. And that's, uh, that's just the fact of spinal cord injury. So, well, you can see that bottom number, 80% of us are males. I guess the risk taking increases our chances. But, you know, like I said, it happens to everybody. I have a friend that was walking a dog down the sidewalk in Santa Monica and a palm tree fell on her. Just randomly. And so, if and when this does happen, all I'm saying is that life will go on and we can live beautiful, healthy, abundant, capable lives with a spinal cord injury. And that's why I'm here as a lifestyle specialist, to just share my lifestyle and show that anything is possible. We can put our hearts and our minds together and create possibility. So thanks for allowing me to share with you guys today. I'm excited to answer your questions, go into more detail about specifics. That's who I am and what I do and why I'm here. So please send in your questions. If you want to know more information about spinal cord injury, visit our website, shieldhealthcare.com, community, spinal cord injury. I'm here to produce blogs, blogs, um, videos, um, and these webinars. So thank you for having me. I look forward to connecting uh, with you more in the future. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, we have a couple questions here right now, but if you have a question, please type it in the question box to the right-hand side. So the first question is, as a healthcare professional, what tips do you have for me when interacting with a patient with a new spinal cord injury? That's a great question. Um, I really feel that education is key uh, when disseminating information. You are the gatekeeper you know, as the healthcare professional. And a patient in that time is very impressionable, very malleable. They're desperate to know what's happening, what's going on. So the more you can educate with facts, um, not hypotheticals, not general statistics, you've got to be careful with, with grouping uh, a person into a general statistic in terms of prognosticating. Uh, you know, you don't want to plant a seed of, at least for me, uh, hearing, you know, that I, that one in a million thing, you know, planting the seed of, of some general set. The truth is, we don't really know. You know, the, the spinal cord injury, uh, the neurological system is so complex that what we can talk about is, are, are the facts, the facts of the, the, the surgery, the facts of um, deconditioned diffuse syndrome, um, the secondary complications that occur. Tell me about skin breakdown. Tell me about pressure sores. Like, educate me uh, about what happens to my body if I just stay immobile. Um, but then, also tell me that if you do challenge this condition, if you do take on a real proactive, responsible role in your health care, that 
all of a sudden it opens up the realm of healing and possibility, and we just don't know how much return of function you can gain over time. You know, there are no expectations. It's not a broken bone. You can't cut a cast off, and in 12 weeks you're back to normal. Uh, this is a lifestyle change completely. So education, uh, for me, and empathy in that education process is vital. Thank you, Aaron. We have another question here. Will you ever try to ride a motorcycle again? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, in, in the capacity that I rode, no. Um, hold handlebars and ride a specially adapted motorcycle? Yes, potentially I will. Uh, I have a project that I'm, I'm working on that hopefully one day soon I will be twisting the throttle in a safe way. Um, but I do not look back. I, I don't wish to ride in the capacity that I did. I have beautiful memories of how I was able to make a motorcycle uh, perform, and I have no desire to go back to that. It's a great question, thanks. We have another question. Um, how can I encourage a patient to accept help from loved ones? That's a great question. You know, a lot of times, at least for me, you know, being a young man, prideful, um, independent, I had a real hard time in the beginning. Even though I couldn't help myself, I didn't want to accept help from other people. I didn't want my mom doing everything for me. I didn't want a stranger, you know, catheterizing me or doing a bowel program or anything. I was just very opposed to that and I struggled and fought against it but really I was doing myself more harm than good and those around me you know if you put the shoe on the other foot all you really want to do is help and you know how good that feels to help someone so when I just let go of that and I allowed someone to just help me it uh, it changed the whole dynamic and allowed me to well um, not suffer quite so much. And it made the people around me feel really good to, to help, because helping someone feels good. So if you can just allow that to be, and if someone wants to open the door for you, allow them to graciously open the door, because that's great. Um, if you need help with uh, your personal care, you know, take it with a grain of salt and let that happen. Conserve your energy and apply it elsewhere. So, yes, yeah, allow people to help you. So we have a question here from a viewer in Southern Illinois mm -hmm. who is a T10, T11 paraplegic. Mm -hmm. How do I find a gym to work out in? That's actually a good question. Um, you know, I wish we had a core for you um, there, uh, but unfortunately we don't, not yet. Uh, I guess, you know, getting online, obviously we're, we're we're um, very lucky to have the network and the resources online. Hopefully you can find something within reason in your local area uh, in terms of an adapted facility that has unique and specialized equipment. Potentially reach out to your local gym and ask them. You know, Talk about a new step machine or some of the Cybex equipment that has swing away chairs or um, you know, types of equipment that are accessible for wheelchairs. Uh, bring that to their attention, or even a community center, uh, you know, like a YMCA or something. A lot of these places are inclined to bring that equipment in for our special population, for people in chairs. So if they don't have it, you could lobby to get it in there. So we have another question um, from a couple different viewers. Firstly, where is CORE located? CORE is located in Northridge, California, um, just north of LA in the San Fernando Valley. We're near the California State uh, Northridge, 9667 Reputa Boulevard. Is your facility covered by insurance? Our, in, our, um, our service is not covered by insurance. We have adjusted our service rates to be fair and reasonable because we know how stretched our financial resources are living with this quite expensive condition. 
Uh, we have worked with um, Workman's Compensation, uh, the VA. We've worked with um, uh, granting organizations like the Chanda Plan, Challenge Athletes Foundation, Triumph Foundation. Uh, these organizations provide grants if you apply for our services. But to answer the question, no, we don't typically take regular insurance. All right, I think we have question uh, time for about two or three more questions. And if at the end your question was not answered, we will reach out to you personally via email to answer those questions. So we have a question here. How do I encourage um, one of my patients to be more independent when they have been relying on loved ones and maybe are a little too dependent? This is a great question, yeah. Well, maybe show them a little bit of, of, you know, some of the adventures I've embarked on. Um, I know what that did for me, looking in on another person living with a spinal cord injury and seeing what all they're doing, what, what they're accomplishing. Uh, there was a guy named Pat Rummerfield from Chicago who in the late 70s broke his neck, you know, similar injury to mine. And he had incredible return of function and, and led, leads a life of, of real action and adventure, and that was just a seed that really, uh, or a spark, I should say, it sparked it in me that if this guy's doing it, I can get out there and do it too, and it motivated me. So pass my story along, if, if, if pass my number along. My email is, is available, send me an email, reach out to me, I'd be happy to get on the phone with him, um, but look out to other, other people's stories, and that's that may be just enough to get him, you know, out there and striving to be independent and adventurous. So the last question we'll have time for today is how do you approach reaching out to people with similar conditions to yours and how do they react to you in your story? Well, I'm very um, I'm very delicate with that. You know, I, I'm not here to impose my story. I, I know that all these conditions are, are different. No two spinal cord injuries are the same. Just because a person does exactly what I've done uh, doesn't mean that they're going to have the same type of return of function, or they may have more. Uh, I don't know. But I'm very um, sensitive to sharing um, my journey. If someone's interested and they want to know more, I am right here. I'm an open book. And I'm always a phone call away or an email away. Uh, if somebody wants to get on and ride with me or walk with me or do whatever, I'm I'm here and available. So, um, you know, I'm if and when you're ready, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and you can reach Aaron at ask Aaron at shieldhealthcare.com. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. Um, it will, like we said, be posted tomorrow since it is a recording. And we will get back to the questions that we did not answer personally. So thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing your story with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. I'm excited to be here, and I look forward to hearing from you. See you again. <laughs>